Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome to this uh, ATC's webinar series. Uh, we've been having a series of uh, uh, webinars. You can check us out on our Facebook page, our Instagram. We've been having a series and so far, coincidentally, right, all the speakers in our series have been uh, uh, alumni. And this is something that, uh, this is a happy coincidence. And uh, now that we thought about it, we want to continue this because we have a large number of very distinguished alumni. Uh, and so Mr. The, the person that we have today with us is Mr. Richard Wee of uh, Richard Wee Chambers, right? Uh, Richard Wee, I'm going to start off with his most important achievement. Uh, he is an ATC alumni. <laughs> uh, no, so yeah, we, we are very proud of him and the work he has done, right? So the topic for today is going to be um, top tips for law graduates and pupils, right? So I hope all of you here are, are law students, uh, pupils, maybe even young lawyers, right? And uh, the experience that uh, Richard has, uh, I'm sure will be incredibly valuable to, to, to all of you. But before we get there, let me just very quickly, very quickly talk about uh, Richard. Richard uh, graduated with a Bachelor of Laws from the University of London, which uh, I've repeated three times now. He did it with us in ATC. <laughs> then he completed the CLP in 98. Uh, then he, his thirst for, for knowledge has not stopped there. He went on to do a certificate in uh, strategic conflict management for professionals by the Singapore Mediation Center. And uh, he's got a whole list of other qualifications, which uh, I'm going to leave you to visit his website, right? Richard Wee Chambers, right? Please uh, take it down, go check out the website, Richard Wee Chambers, right? And you can read his... Uh, uh, highlights there, but there are a few things that I want to point out today, right? So in 2016, Richard obtained a certificate of sports arbitration from AIAC. And for those of you who are football fans, right? Richard supports Everton. I hope all of you are not leaving now. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Huh? Right, Richard is a, is a hardcore, and I, I know this, we are friends. Uh, he's a hardcore Everton supporter. But, and he's also, right, he takes, he puts his... Uh, I suppose mouth where the money is, I suppose, uh, because uh, in 2019, FIFA and the Football Association of Malaysia appointed Richard to the Appeals oh. Committee of the National Disputes Resolution Chambers, mm. right? So guys, uh, if you are a lawyer and you love football and things like that, you can do some actual real work uh, in sports law, like what Richard is doing. Richard is one of the leading people in sports law in Malaysia, although that's not the topic of conversation today. But we are going to have him back to talk about sports law. We definitely are going to have him back to talk about sports law in the next few weeks. Tune in for that. Uh, again, there's no way of cutting this short because uh, Richard, is, uh, his list of uh, achievements is amazing. But very quickly, some accolades. Huh? Uh, in his previous firm, Richard led his sports law practice group to win consecutive awards at the Asian Legal Business Malaysia Law Awards. Yeah. Uh, Sports Law Firm of the Year. So when I told you he was a leader in the industry, I was not kidding. He has been uh, described as an expert in sports law and um, best boutique firm for sports law. All this in his previous firm, but that entire expertise has been brought to uh, Richard B. Chambers, as I'm sure he will tell you as well. Uh, Richard also very, very distinguishedly served in the Malaysian Bar. He was a uh, Bar Secretary uh, at 2013 to 2015. Councillor before that for about five years, and the Kuala Lumpur Bar Committee from 2005 to 2010. Um, Richard, some of you who came in a bit earlier would have heard uh, Richard was very proud of that one achievement, which I'm going to leave him to explain later as well, as part of his um, uh, telling you what a young lawyer can do at the bar. Right? So, Richard, after that, welcome. Yeah, welcome, welcome. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. It's always good to be back in ATC. Um, so uh, to start your legal career, um, uh, it's of course it's, it's, it's a challenging career, interesting career, um, a career with uh, a lot of uh, options and varieties. It can be absorbing. Um, it can be also difficult, but uh, it is also extremely enriching, and it, it is quite crucial that uh, people get into involved in a bar must uh, be, have some level of passion for the work. So thank you very much for the introduction. Um, it, was a, uh, it was a fantastic four years for me in ATC, uh, three years in, as, a, as an LLB student, and one year doing CLP. 
uh, at ATC also. I went back to ATC to do my CLP. And um, of course, at, during my time in 93 to 96, he was led by uh, Dr. Siva and the late Danny Chung, um, Dr. Danny Chung. So it was a, a really, really formidable law school. And I, I still think it is still one of the most formidable law schools in, in the country, if not the world. So Daniel, well, uh, thanks for welcoming me back. Um, I look forward to sharing some tips. I'll, I'll wait for your Q&A and then I will, of course, re reply to your Q&A. And to sure. all the, the participants who have logged on and those who are watching uh, us on Facebook, much obliged. You know, you could be anywhere else at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and you'll talk on to watch this. Um, and of course, those who, are, uh, who miss this, uh, you can always watch this later because it's on Facebook. It'll be permanently on Facebook. It's also live on Richard V. Chambers' page. Um, so with, with that in mind, uh, Daniel, I'm all yours. Uh, and uh, uh, should ask me any question and I hope to be able to offer some ideas, some tips and some solutions for uh, the pupils and law students who are in this webinar now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, so uh, obviously the, the target of this uh, talk today has been uh, law students, right? Undergraduates, uh, recent graduates, and also uh, pupils. And although with a law degree, as you also alluded to earlier, with a law degree, uh, there's, there's a variety of things that you can do, right? There's a variety of things you can do. But I suspect the majority of uh, our guests today, our attendants today, want to be a lawyer. So let's start off on that basis, right? Uh, what do you think are the uh, characteristics of an effective lawyer? If one of our participants today is sitting there and thinking, I want to be an awesome lawyer, I want to be a good lawyer, what do I need to do? Mm. Well, um, unfortunately, as you know, uh, the typical lawyer, we always have an exclusion clause before we start our answer. So as you can see, I am uh, trained to be a lawyer. Uh, unfortunately, as you know, uh, we have a question as wide as that, it is virtually impossible for me to offer a, an exhaustive and a universal advice. But I'll try my best to give uh, some ideas. So I think looking back, uh, instead of trying to see things forward and saying that, look, I'm a pupil now, I'm a student now, and what do I want to, how, what do I need to do to become a, a good lawyer, an effective lawyer? Uh, so I look back at my career, this is my 21st year as a lawyer. Um, and there's still many other seniors ahead of me who are uh, really awesome lawyers, good barristers, good counsels, uh, fantastic corporate lawyers, blah, blah, blah. So there are many of people ahead of me. Uh, so there's still for me, much more for me to learn. But from, from the last 21 years of practice, uh, plus the one year as a pupil, so it's effectively 22 years. Um, I, I think the key uh, character that you must have, and that's the word, lah. you must have the character of a lawyer. You know, you must build, and I'm going to expand on that, uh, what it means by character of a lawyer. You must have the character of a lawyer, you must have the attitude of a lawyer. And I think most students here would have heard that from, the, from people like you, Daniel. I'm sure in ATC or wherever they are from, uh, UNISA or University Malaya, BAC, I know there could be some um, uh, uh, Taylors uh, or even MMU students is here. So welcome aboard. But I'm sure your lecturers would have told you you must have the correct attitude. And I'm going to try and expand that, you know. Um, so I'm writing down here character and attitude so that I remember to, to come back to this. And then, but you know, Daniel, um, I'm going to do something different. Lah. Instead of trying to talk about what you should be, let me try and highlight a court case which I think, I hope everyone here would know. If not, then you are in trouble because if you're already studying law for so long, you still don't know this case, which I'm going to talk about, then you're in big trouble. And that case I want to talk about is Carlisle against Publix Mobiles. Yeah. I, I choose that case because it's the easiest. I, I cannot imagine any law student anywhere in the Commonwealth world not knowing Carlisle against Publix Mobiles. So, and in fact, when I, when I teach ethics in the bar, this is one of the cases that I use. But, you know, in Carlisle against public smoke balls, as we know, public smoke balls tried to defend the suit against Mrs. Carlisle, who wanted to claim uh, her reward. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Daniel, was it a 50 pounds or 100 pounds reward, is it? I, if I'm contracts, I'm just in area, but 100 pounds, I think. Yeah, I think so. I can't remember the quantum, really. But what was interesting was, Lord Justice Bowen, in that case, had to address the, 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 the arguments and the submissions of the lawyer. You know, 
And uh, one of the arguments the lawyer for Kabbalik Smokeball raised was that that so-called advertisement was a mere path. Um, so I remember those days in ATC, my lecturer was uh, Mr. Murali Kandasamy before he left to, to BAC. He used to joke about, uh, or, and, and Mr. Twega Prasad, uh, who was my senior, uh, was joking that this is a curry puff argument, uh, the, the mere puff argument. Then, of course, Lord Justice Bowen dismissed that. And he went on to say whether it was an invitation to trade, whether it was a unilateral offer, et cetera, et cetera. Now, why am I raising this case? What was important was this case was decided more than 100 years ago. Uh, and at the time, if you try to visualize the world at the time, there was no, the lawyers were definitely not driving an Audi A6 to court. They were not having, uh, you know, Panerai watches to go to court. They had no Google, no Lexus Nexus. They probably even don't have the hard copies of the All England reports like the way we have it. They don't have journals. They don't have a mobile phone to call a lecturer from University of London to get an opinion. But yet, those set of lawyers who defended public smoke balls, in my view, brilliantly created these, these arguments in order for them to defend the client. So they passionately defend the client, whether the client was right or wrong. They raise innovative arguments uh, without any, um, any help from internet. They use something many of us have taken for granted. And that is they use their brains. <laughs> many of us, you know, now they just, anything, they just go through this and hope Lexus Nexus uh, give an answer to them. Uh, we live in a spoon feed generation. Um, so that, that, that is, if you look at what they did, I want lawyers to be like that. Innovative, passionate, invested. They clearly invested their their mind and their, their practice into that case. They did all they could to save Kabbalik smoke balls. But as many of us know, eventually Kabbalik smoke balls lost and uh, went down. Uh, they could not afford to pay 100 pounds to all the users. So, uh, but what I really like about the case when I look back is that uh, we are reading uh, an authority about some people who are all have passed away but we're still reading their work. So that's the other aspect I want to ask all of everybody here. That in 30, 40 years from now, when we are all old and frail, um, when we are nearing the end of our career, how do you want to look back to your career? How do you want to see your career? I mean, look at our friend, Mr. Mr. Daniel. Look at him. It's a fantastic career. He's built a law school. He went to BAC. Uh, he came back to ATC, you know, as a head of academy. You know, he's building a, 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 a thought process. Uh, this is called the thought training. Uh, every new lawyer I meet is either uh, Daniel's student or someone's student, a Raja Singham student in BAC. These are all people who have a... When they look back, Daniel will say, I've done this, you know, I, I produced three, four, five hundred lawyers. Thousands of lawyers came to us. So I want to ask people who are here, who have signed on, um, you ask yourself, not, not, not answer me, how do you want to end your career? So that's why I meant just now, Daniel, instead of looking back, why don't we look at the end and ask yourself, how do you want to end it? Because you look at Carla against Kabbalik Smoke Balls, each and every one of you here have read the case, but many of you don't know the name of the lawyers. You don't know how they photocopied the case. Did they photocopy the case? You know? The horse that they rode the rope that they carry, the fact that they have to climb staircases, no aircon, no heater. You know, how did they do it? You know, so um, if you look at that, then you, one more thing to add before I pass the mic back to you, metaphorically pass the mic back to you, Daniel, is this. If you look at every single court case that we all have studied, I am pretty certain that there is no judge no lawyer, particularly no judge, who will make a decision and say something like, let's make it difficult for the small guy. Let's bully the victim. Let's, uh, if, if, the, if the girl is, uh, the victim is raped, let's highlight the victim and blame everything on the victim. 
most ki- cases don't do that. So uh, inherently and internally, if you all really look at your law degree and your law syllabus, it is all about doing the right thing. It's all about doing the correct thing. And I know this sounds very cliche, but it's really doing good. It is good versus evil. And law is all about being good. It's trying to do the right thing. How many times, uh, Daniel, we study in class uh, about, uh, you know, Caparo and Dickman, White and Jones, we studied on for thought, whether the law firm was wrong in White and Jones for not amending the, the, the will. Uh, it all boils down to the lack of communication, failure to communicate. But the court protected the family members of the will, even though the family members and the lawyer have no tortious relationship, no contractual relationship. But in White and Jones, the court agreed to assist uh, the beneficiaries of the will. And you saw in the case of the infam- the famous, or depending on how you look at it, the famous or infamous case of uh, Central London Property Trust against High Trees, the High Trees case, the promissory estoppel case by the legendary Lord Denning. You know, how, how often Lord Denning stepped in to uh, equalize the inequality, to balance the imbalance, to shield the poor and to help the weak. How many times we have that, seen that? So if you notice that, then you should realize by now that your career is always doing the right thing. So you need to have the character um, to have the, the Herculean lawyer, I call it, being a Hercules lawyer who is uh, invested, uh, is um, interested, passionate, with integrity, always doing the right thing, no cheating, no stealing clients' account money. These are the small, small things, you know. So uh, th- these are the general topics uh, I-, I would like to address, uh, particularly later about character and attitude uh, when we expand. All yours, Daniel. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. I, uh, I think uh, the students' uh, take back was that uh, an effective lawyer is, is, obviously the question was very wide, right? But an effective lawyer is, uh, is someone who strives to do good. So set that goal for yourself, strives to do good, strives to help the, the small man, uh, try, uh, does, you know, does good things and uh, work your way towards it. Okay, so speaking about uh, working your way towards it. So let's say um, I am a law student right now. I am a fresh faced, bright eyed, year one uh, undergraduate student or year two, year three, whatever, right? What, what, can, I, what can I do? Right? How can I how can I develop these, uh, these these characteristics to help the people? Is there any particular skills I need? Things like that, right? How do I make myself uh, apart from just being a good lawyer, but also how do I make uh, myself appealing to a potential employer? Mm. Good question. Uh, by the way, uh, Daniel and I think JD is uh, listening in. Uh, I. Can I suggest that the chat be disabled, uh, the enable, so that people can chat, put questions? Uh, I notice the chat is uh, disabled. Is there a purpose? Uh, oh, yes. It's open now. It's open already now. Okay. Okay. Right here. Can I? Okay. All right. For just now, I tried to. Okay. So um, to answer your question, uh, that that issue, uh, uh, Daniel, I think, how do you build a character of a lawyer? Um, and also how to be. Uh, if uh, attractive to employers. Hmm. Good question. Now, I'll try to answer the first one first very quickly. Um, of course, unfortunately, character is something, if you have it, you have it. If you don't have it, then it's, a, it's going to be a challenge for everybody. But I am uh, confident that most people, in fact, generally most people, unless you are a fairly petulant beauty pageant winner who insists that she's right. But <laughs> minus that kind of character, um, I would think most of us are inherently wanting to do good. We all love our mothers. We love um, our, our life. We love our families. We want to protect our well-being. 
Uh, those who love pets will love your dogs and cats dearly. You will hug them to sleep. Uh, of course, I'm quite upset when people who don't like cats and they start kicking cats. I mean, if you don't like them, don't kick them, you know. But that aside, I think most of the people character they character they have a, a good character, right? But for a lawyer's character, you um, you really got to build uh, a, a uh, your confidence. Um, and in order to build confidence, you need to know the law. And many times uh, we do things for the first time. So, for example, over the last six, seven months, my law firm has been invested in investing our time in fintech and startups. So, startups, of course, not new, but fintech is fairly new, and it's it's new to me. Um, but you know, we go back to basics. So, always remember to all the law students: if you are doing something new, go back to your basics, your offer, acceptance, consideration. How do you search the law? Look at the statute. Look at the contract law in Malaysia. Of course, everything is statute based. Read case laws. Find the color against public smoke balls for fintech. Find out what is it about. How does it work? Talk to people who know. Get your basics right, and then you can start advising. So then, in short, the character is you, you must be hardworking. You really there's no <laughs> this one cannot compromise. You have to be hardworking. You know. I always ask uh, lawyers, I said, have you heard of anybody of your friend or even yourself who unfortunately fell ill and have to go to hospital at two o'clock in the morning? I'm 100% sure everybody here would have heard about it, unfortunately gone through it, or seen movies about it. Everybody watching Netflix, you would have seen some movie, somebody falling sick at two o'clock in the morning and rushing to hospital. You know something very interesting, Daniel, about that? Mm -hmm. When you go to hospital, there's a doctor waiting for you there. Yeah. I would hope so. <laughs> yeah. And that doctor studied far longer than you and me. Yeah. Six, seven years, he or she struggled to get through, paid far more higher tuition fees than us, and then go through housemanship, suffering, sleeping in hospital under the floor or under the bed on the floor. You know, horrible. But we expect that this person who is far more um, invested in their career than us to be there at 2 a.m. waiting for us because you got a big stomach ache. You must be there. You insist they must be there. You expect that. But as a, as a lawyer, you have to go home at 5 because you want to have a work-life balance. You need to watch the Korean TV show when you go back. You know? <laughs> you, you can't work longer than that. You don't understand why you need to work on the weekends when you don't realize that being a lawyer, we are a fireman. We are, uh, that's another character. We are a fireman. We are a, on standby 24 hours. You will never get a call, uh, Daniel, from a client to say, hello, Daniel, this is uh, Mr. Chong. Huh? I'm telling you now that next week I'm going to murder someone. So you'll be, an, you'll be on standby. So when they arrest me, I, I, I only forewarn you. Can you go ahead and start reading up on your section 302 of the penal code and get ready to defend me? You know what I mean? You'll be very worried if you get the kind of call. The client is psychotic, you know. But uh, that, that's the point. A lot of times, our career, we are only involved when there's trouble. Unless, of course, you do corporate work where you are drafting the contract from the beginning. But the point being is that you are, you must be, your career is fluid. You must be prepared all the time. You have to be, uh, as a fireman, standby all the time, you know. A bit hard for me to cover everything on that area, but I'm going to move on to the next one. Uh, and by the way, Daniel, if you want to extend the talk beyond three o'clock, no problem. Okay. Okay. Now, thank you. Um, so back to this issue of uh, being attractive to employers. Now, there are eighteen over thousand lawyers in in Peninsular Malaysia, and then our counterparts in in Borneo, uh, I think there's about thousand, two thousand lawyers there, maybe more. And of this, of course, uh, there are a few thousand law firms uh, scattered all over uh, Malaya. And so it's quite difficult for, for me to give a definitive advisory on what every employer or most employer want to do. But I'm going to try to give some universal uh, values which um, most law firms look out for. I think most lawyers, uh, when, they, when they interview a, a potential candidate, uh, they'll try to see your paper qualification how good you did in school, your law degree, 
first class, second class, third class. Most lawyers will do that. When you go for the interview, they probably give you a test uh, about the rules of court, uh, especially if you're applying to a civil litigation law firm or some basic question on CPC, which is the Criminal Procedure Code, if you're going into a criminal law firm, or some general question about stock exchange or security commission or uh, financial investment, uh, angel investment, if you're doing uh, corporate work. So most lawyers will do that. They'll test you. And they, of course, want to see whether you're sharp, whether you are polite, whether you are able to converse well, you are able to speak uh, a fairly fluent uh, English or Bahasa Malaysia. Jadi kalau kamu kamu memasuki ke firma-firma yang kebanyakannya peguamnya orang Melayu dan kebanyakannya bertutur dalam Bahasa Melayu, jadi lebih baiklah kalau kalau penggunaan bahasa kamu itu lebih kuat. Tapi kalau penggunaan bahasa Malaysia kamu tak berapa kuat, jadi kemungkinan firma-firma yang biasanya dan lazimnya menggunakan bahasa Malaysia mungkin tidak akan berminat untuk mengambil kamu. So you got to take into account the interest of language. Um, so this uh, uh, this is something you may want to consider. You know that um, that uh, uh, law firms will look into um, your language skills, your character, your attitude, answerings, and all that. But for me, Daniel, just speaking on my law firm, yes. and I, I don't think, unfortunately, I think I am not. I'm not majority. I, I don't think I am the universal uh, uh, interview. I, I don't think we are. We are. I, the, the way I interview people, I don't think that's the way most law firms do it. Now, what I do is that when I receive a CV, I really look at the way the person write the CV first. And immediately we know that it's a template. Cut and paste. Um, and then, of course, some lawyers, some pupils, they try. I know they try. They write uh, fairly good English. Um, and they went to our website. They know I'm an Everton fan. They know I like sports, for example, without realizing that Richard Wee Chambers, only 20% of our work is sports. We, we do a lot more other work. But never mind, you know, uh, because you are quite well known for sports, they may when, when pupils do so. But I would always prefer if the pupils spend time, um, and there's a keyword, investment. Back to what I said earlier, to invest, you know, uh, to respect. Uh, so you write uh, your own letter, you know, dear to, to Mrs. Richard Wee Chambers, to Mrs. Chong Akao and Co, to Mrs. Muhammad Kamal and Co, and you write, say, I am Richard Wee. I recently graduated from University of London in 1996, and I completed my CLP in 1997. I am prepared and willing to uh, immediately launch a career in the law legal profession. And I would be an honor to join your firm as a pupil. I am well aware that your firm is located in Bangsa or uh, in Ipoh. And you say, so when the person reads, he or she knows that you are really writing to him, a one-to-one, -one, right? Then, uh, of course, it depends. Some lawyers, they will take the time to reply and some lawyers are just too busy or with respect, some lawyers also are, uh, have an attitude so they may say, oh, yeah, I don't care, so they don't reply. But never mind, it's okay, you know, even if they don't reply, but you must do the right thing by doing that. So I would encourage that. So that's first I do, see the letter. And then I have a quick look at the CV and I realize that the person got a law degree. I don't really care whether the person, person finished first, second or third, but that's just me, huh? by the way, just me. Then I usually try to pick up the phone and call the person. That's the best interview, Daniel. Because the person totally never expect a call from me. <laughs> and, uh, and that's how I chit chat with the person. And usually during the conversation where the pupils are usually caught off guard, you will see the true self of the pupil. Hmm. And also, um, and of course, why I do that, I'm not testing the person. I just want to see whether I can work with him or her. Because that's important. Whether I, we can work with him or her. If you are intelligent and you're articulate and you are on paper academically brilliant, good. Uh, good for the client. If you are smart, my client is happy. <laughs> but uh, if you are not that sharp and your English is more like England, you check up England, you know, <laughs> your, uh, your Bahasa Malaysia pun tak berapa bagus, uh, karat sikit, 
and you are into you you are a Mandarin speaking lawyer or a Tamil speaking lawyer, I I have no problem with that. I can work on that. But it's your character and attitude that I I would like to uh, test on whether whether we can work together. Richard, I, I, hmm. sorry. I'm just going to interject here because we got a question. I, I'm going to ask everyone to keep the questions to the end, but type it in the chat group. But this was a relevant point for me to insert this question from Yung Wei. Yung Wei, hi Yung Wei. Uh, do you mean Bahasa Malaysia is equally important as the English language to be a lawyer in Malaysia? So since you brought it up, I thought you could answer Yung Wei here. Sure. I'll, I'll, I'll come to the answer. I'll answer. So okay. back to what I was saying just now, why I want to make sure that it, work, it can work with me because in my firm, uh, and, and every, every in any firm that I work in, and of course now I, I'm back on uh, being a managing partner of my firm again. Um, so before Marvin Kwai, I was a fellow partner in Richard Wee and Yip. So Yip and I were running a firm for seven years, eight years. Uh, what was important in every firm was can you work with not just me but my colleagues. So that's why I want it's important because if you get a disruptive figure, then the firm will be affected. You know, so that, that was an important aspect. Now, to answer the issue of communication, uh, I, I think we must learn to respect that uh, in Malaysia, uh, the, the uh, Bahasa Malaysia is our national language. And generally, in the lower courts, in the magistrates and, and sessions courts, uh, some judges, uh, magistrates, are inclined to uh, engage in the Malay language. Uh, so that, that's, that's one matter you need to consider. And of course, if you are con, uh, con, conversing, sorry, if you are serving, that's the word I was talking about, serving the uh, government, uh, working with the government agencies, uh, there is a possibility that you may have to uh, communicate in Bahasa Malaysia. Uh, contracts are drafted in Bahasa Malaysia. But to say that it is uh, the question posed by uh, the lady, uh, is equally important. Yes, it is. It is equally important as English uh, to in practice. So you need to understand basic uh, Bahasa Malaysia. You don't have to be fluent. I, I am very fortunate in my life that I grew up in the police quarters. Uh, my father is a policeman. He is, my mom is from Kelantan. My father is from Kelantan. We speak Malay at home sometimes. So I grew up in an atmosphere where Bahasa Malaysia was a really a um, normal language for me. But if you are uncomfortable with the usage of Bahasa Malaysia or English, some of you may not be comfortable in English because you speak Mandarin or whatever, um, it's time for you to brush up. You know? And um, if I can just share with my experience, Daniel, and pass it back to you here. Yeah. When I started my law degree, at the beginning of this interview, I, I told you this, that uh, in 1983, when I joined ATC, uh, while I was from an English school, uh, in, a, in a La Salle school of Ipoh, St. Michael's in Ipoh, we all speak English, we converse in English. Uh, but I was a Malay debater, I debated in Bahasa Malaysia. Uh, but I knew my English, especially my written English, was very weak. And my triple one nine, I only had a C5. It was a very, very poor result. Because my, all my other results was either an A or C. Or, or a C3, you know. So I was very disappointed and I knew that I was going to struggle when I go into law school. So I bought a mini Oxford dictionary and within a two, three months in ATC, I photocopied uh, a copy of the uh, legal dictionary. And in my bag, that two books was with me all the way until I finished my CLP. I read that Every day. Sometimes in the bus, mini those days, in the miracle moments when I get a place to sit down, you'll be shocked that I actually go through my English dictionary to read up and understand some of the bombastic words. So you need to improve your language. Lah. And I read lots of uh, sports magazine. Uh, I wasn't a big lover of Harry Potter and whatever, lot of the rings at the time. I love sports. And so I made sure I read lots and lots of sports English magazines to improve my English. So unfortunately, Daniel, those days when I write my submissions and my essay or my assignment, it looked like a sports magazine. <laughs> yeah. All yours, sir, Daniel. Okay, great. So uh, very quickly to, to just summarize, I think uh, 
uh, based on what you said, uh, the CV is important, right? The CV is definitely important. You do place a lot of importance. So students, please remember that because I get, uh, sometimes I get C CVs with uh, no, no email, no cover letter, nothing. And it's just all over the place. So it's important, right? Character is important. Attitude is important. Can you work with the lawyer that you are, that you are going to, you are wanting to work for? Research your firm. That's important as well. That's something I got from uh, Richard as well. Language is important, both English and Malay. And, and I, I cannot agree with you more on this, right? I think uh, the, the command of the Malay language is, is absolutely vital for a, a variety of reasons, but also because uh, we live in Malaysia, right? So you, you've told us, uh, Richard, a lot of things about what you look for, and I think it's been very useful. Can you share maybe from your experience of being an employer for some time now, your own firm, uh, you were a partner before, you're the managing partner and previously in a bigger firm. So I think you've got the unique uh, insight from uh, maybe a slightly smaller firm, a boutique firm, a bigger firm. So if you've done interviews for pupils or lawyers before, what are the common mistakes that they make? What can our participants today consciously avoid when they go for an interview? Good, good question. Before I start, I just want to say, I just noticed uh, she's online. Hi, Winnie. I think you're in office. Yeah, hello. Yeah. <laughs> I'll see you on Instagram later. Um, uh, Winnie is a young pupil working in a leading law firm in Bangsa. Her, her master is a good friend of mine, brilliant mind, uh, Dato Wong, smart guy. So, uh, this, um, um, I think, let's first start with the CV you mentioned, right? You send a CV. So, the fact that the lawyer call you for an interview, okay, lah, your CV. Can jalan lah, you know, there's something in the CV lah, right? But let's, let me just go something in the CV first before we talk about the interview itself. I think in the CV, it's very important to have a flow. Uh, as much as it sounds obvious, but sometimes some of the CV are all over the place. Uh, it would be highly recommended to put your name, address. Uh, you don't have to give me your IC number yet, but your name, address and your mobile number and your email is very important. And I, I know we're all protecting our data, but you're apply, applying to get a job, so you have to share that. And then in your CV, please inform us of your law degree, your bar exams, CLP exams, your results. Uh, and then I, I don't really need to go until your standard five, standard six exam. I think up to SPM is, is sufficient. Uh, and then, you know, I would like to see your core curriculum. In fact, for me, again, personally, uh, uh, you see, you must understand, uh, Daniel, a lot of times lawyers... When they look for pupil, they look for someone who's like them. So that's why, like what you say, you need to research on that lawyer. You know, so like, like for me, I, I, I was a school head prefect, you know, I, I played football for school. So, you, you, I, so I, I appreciate when someone put in a CV and says they were a badminton player for the school. So like, whoa, you know, not bad, you know. Uh, so these are the things you may want to put. You never know. The, 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 the master may be interested to give you a call. So that's in your CV. And of course, write in proper English or in Bahasa Malaysia. Please, get your English right. Don't use Google Translate. Then after that, interview. So interview, you come for an interview, please be early. Please be early. So if you, like in my former law firm in Mao uh, they had a uh, fantastic Q&A to be given. An aptitude test. Very, very, very stringent test. But that's because MWK is a really large firm. And MWK... It's also a very traditional old firm. Uh, of course, they are much more modern now, but they have a very old school uh, um, tradition to it. Well, because Dato Ma is still there. And, uh, but the current partner, Raymond, has modernized the firm. It's, it's, a, it's a really fantastic place to work. I would recommend here, anybody here to apply there. You know? um, but they go through a very stringent aptitude test. And eventually, you meet face-to-face -face with the partner in charge. And that's where you can see whether you... Uh, able to persuade the partner that you are good enough. Uh, so during the interview, uh, for people like me, we, we don't have a test. Uh, in RWC, those who apply, you, lucky you, no test yet, not yet. We, do, we don't intend to have a test. Even in RWY, my earlier firm, we have no test. Uh, we sit down, we chit-chat with you. The conversation takes up half an hour to one hour. Uh, I ask all kinds of questions with you. Uh, and, and I, in fact, encourage the pupil uh, or the applicant to ask me questions. Ask me, what, what do you want to know? Anything, you know. 
So, and sometimes the measure, the questions uh, reflect the mentality and the thinking of the pupil. So you know what's in the mind of the pupil when they ask a question. So for example, if the pupil is asking about allowance, so they know, I know then that for this pupil, uh, finances is important. Um, some people, of course, talk about whether it can be retained, work-life balance, where do they sit in the office, blah, 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 you know? Uh, so these are the, the things we do. And it's important for the people to dress up well. Uh, I know I'm not talking about dressing up in, in your Prada or Jojo Armani. You know, just come in a, a very, very um, professional look. Not bright, not too loud. Uh, and even though I'm uh, uh, generally not bothered about uh, the length of the skirt, for example, when it comes to ladies, but I think some law firms are uh, unfortunately very conservative. So that's why the world is very unfair to ladies, uh, Daniel. The men can dress up, you know, but women are must wear a short skirt. I, I, but that's society, you know, I, I, I don't agree, but that's how it is. So like my law firm, you know, even if you come in a swimsuit, I will, I will talk to you, but I will find it very funny if you're wearing a swimsuit sitting in front of me. But I'll still talk to you. I'll talk to you. I, I won't judge you yet, you know. And I'll ask you why you're wearing a swimsuit. But uh, I mean, I ask anybody here in this group, if, if you are going to a mama stall and ordering a roti chanai, and the vendor comes to you wearing an underwear to ask you what you want to eat, will you be comfortable? So if you're not comfortable with a mama guy wearing an underwear only to take your order, then ask yourself, how would you should wear when you come to a law firm? Taking into account that we wear this uh, every day in office. Then after it comes to communication, uh, Daniel, the words you use, the choice of words you talk. So it's important for you if you are uh, nervous, you try to get it out of the, to, of the system. The lawyer will know that you're nervous. It's very easy to see when you're nervous. And we understand. You know, it's very daunting to meet a lawyer. You just finish your law school, first time you're meeting me or anybody else. And some lawyers are very intimidating, uh, very strict, very serious. So you just got to take it because that's the legal, pro the legal practice. You haven't met the judges yet. You haven't met difficult clients yet. So, um, uh, but at the same time, of course, if the, if the interviewer is being nasty and difficult and violent with you, verbally violent with you, then maybe that's not a law firm for you. you know, so I'm not, I'm not defending all the lawyers and the clients. I'm not saying that just because it's a difficult profession and everybody is by nature very serious, it doesn't mean you need to take it and shut up. I'm not saying that. So I'm saying that you can move away if someone is nasty. You know? So, uh, so then after that, it's the way you answer a question. Think before you answer. You know? And then try to articulate it in a simple English. Don't sound like uh, one of the current deputy minister now. Everything want to use bombastic language. You know? Just speak simple English. And kalau, kalau temu duga tu dalam bahasa Melayu, uh, gunalah bahasa Melayu yang uh, enak dan selesa di, diperdengarkan. Tak payah berpantun-pantun, berpuisi-puisi, no need. Just take to the point. Yeah, it? Okay. Uh, so everyone, uh, thank you for sending in questions. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep the questions to the end, right? So uh, there will be a Q&A session for those of, you, those of you who have asked questions. We are definitely going to address each and every one. Richard has promised us time, so don't worry about it, right? Just stay on till the end, right? So very quickly, Richard, the CV needs to be good. Uh, pay attention because it shows your details, uh, attention to detail, right? Your clothes, not necessarily expensive, but look uh, neat, look neat. presentable, yeah. right? Uh, the words that you use, how you speak, right? Ask intelligent questions. Uh, and I think this is something you need, uh, students need to be prepared for because I think the interviewer will always ask, do you have any questions? And if you're going to just stare at the interviewer for two minutes without having anything prepared, it looks not so great, right? Be on time. Uh, be on time. Very, very, very important, right? Uh, Richard, so moving on, like I told you, a lot of our students, a lot of our participants here are still undergraduates. So, and, and I know it's not fair for, you, for me to ask you what is the view of the entire bar? That's impossible, right? So as much as you can, but also importantly, in your experience from let's say Marvin Kwai and uh, company and Richard Wee and Yip and Richard Wee Chambers and other experience that you have, 
how important is academic results to uh, whether you get hired or not? So it's a question of academic results versus uh, extracurricular activities. And mm -hmm. when I say extracurricular activities, I mean badminton, uh, mooting, uh, client negotiation, things like that, in your opinion, Richard. Good. Very good question. Again, Dennis. no wonder you're the Chico. You know how to <laughs> ask questions, yeah. Um, of course, uh, I always joke with my lawyers and my partners that any applicant who put in, in their CV and say that they are a massive Everton fan, then they are taken. They, they'll join my firm straight away. Uh, but uh, so far, <laughs> I haven't met any applicant who is an Everton fan. So that's how uh, uh, small the group of supporters are. But on now, policy, all, of you, all of you know now. <laughs> well, on a serious note, um, uh, I, I think when you apply um, to a firm, which is, you have to look at the, st the stature of the firm. And I'm not talking about the size of the firm. I'm looking at the stature of the firm. You know, we have some very, very senior and formidable lawyers out there who run a boutique firm, uh, like Dato Ambiga or uh, Mr. Uh, Nahindran Navaranam, you know, a uh, brilliant lawyer. Uh, they, these are lawyers who run a very small boutique firm. Uh, and also there's a big firm, the, the Shuns, the Screens, RDLs, um, Surafix, all these big firms, Marvin Kwais. Usually these firms, they, they try to capture talent um, who have uh, excelled in the undergraduate days. So there is a, an inclination among the members of the bar that if you are a first class degree holder from a renowned university, then chances are most, uh, most of the employers will be keen to meet you. Chances are. Uh, and of course, for some law firms, uh, in fact, I would dare say most law firms, your co-curriculum activities in universities and of course your law, your, your uh, secondary school days uh, will come in handy because it actually kind of tell us your character, whether you are by nature a volunteerism kind of guy or girl, um, whether you have some sort of leadership, being a head librarian, head quartermaster, St. John Ambulance, uh, a leader, you know, or the top five leadership. You don't have to be number one, but if you are there, then we can gauge that uh, you have that leadership. Uh, we do uh, value leadership in the bar. So these are things that we take into account. And to answer your question, yes, we do see, I also see, I will see uh, the qualification of the person. But I have had before uh, graduates who I know struggled through their LLB, but seem to work very well with us. Um, not very good in verbal uh, communication, but very diligent, hardworking, honest, very honest. Uh, I've had pupils coming to me and says, you know, boss, I'm so sorry. I think I made a mistake. And I listened to the person. Of course, I'm quite unhappy because we now have to redo the work. Uh, but we try to repair it. And, uh, and I look, uh, study the character of the person, how he or she tried to remedy it. And I, I, I would appreciate when someone own up and try to remedy it. But of course, I'm very concerned if the pupil constantly make errors then there's a problem with focus, uh, something I can't help. Uh, I can try to change the situation, but you know, we can only build the road, but the pupil needs to walk the path. You know? So uh, that, these are the things uh, we look for. Lah. So uh, uh, yes, uh, I think qualification uh, from a fairly prestigious university uh, will be a persuasive factor. But I will not say it is a defining factor. Okay, students, you heard that. Study hard, right? Uh, make sure you get those grades. Uh, it is a factor. And I think uh, Richard went out of his way to say it's a factor, a big factor, but not the only factor for sure. So make sure you still uh, inculcate that leadership skills. And, and sometimes it's just about attending talks like this, learn more, do some mooting, do some... Do something, you know, join a club, you know, organize something because those skills are important. 
Now, that is a very interesting uh, segue to my next question, Richard, which is, uh, so obviously to be a lawyer, you need to have legal skills. You must know how to read statutes. You must need, know how to uh, uh, you know, interpret statutes, things like that. But are there non-legal skills that are oh, vital yeah, for a lawyer? What yeah. are the non-legal skills that are vital for a lawyer for that lawyer to perhaps, you know, not only become a successful lawyer, but to run a successful firm, maybe? Uh, this is tying in with some of the questions that have come in. So, so yeah, what are the non-legal skills that a lawyer should have <laughs> for the practice? Uh, again, uh, this is very a very probing question, something which uh, I think many students um, take it for granted. I wish we had this kind of sessions back in 93, 94, 95 to teach me, you know. Uh, I think one important, I wouldn't use the word skills. Um, this one I'm speaking from experience, uh, Daniel, and I'm paying the price for it. Um, my personal experience. Uh, by nature, I, I've always been a fairly uh, affirmative person. Uh, some would say aggressive. Um, you know, being a debater, being a school football player, uh, you, you, you fight hard. And sometimes you forgot that you should stop fighting. So, um, and then in me, um, by nature, I was a fairly... Um, I'm I'm a I'm a perfectionist. I'm, I've been told that I'm a perfectionist, and as a perfectionist, when you don't get things your way, you get quite upset. So in my early days of my career, um, I, and I I also value highly value fair play, highly highly value fair play. So so for example, I I, I really find it very sad that, um, and I'm going to say this. I know it sounds very like a joke, but just pardon my uh, grant me this. Uh, opportunity to just share with this, that sometimes I find it very funny that uh, for football, for example, uh, Liverpool fans, they have no qualms uh, um, saying things, insulting things about Everton. Uh, just insult. It's very natural. Just insult, insult, insult in the word of banter. And all those days, of course, 20 years ago, it would have been a big fight. Uh, but then now, you know, I take it that the person who speaks that way reflects that person that uh, he or she lacks the decorum of respect. Um, so th that, I'm just using that because, especially for the male participants here who love football, and I know some ladies love football too, you get very passionate when people attack your club. And the same way will happen to you when you practice because your opponent, when they send an affidavit in reply to you, will attack you. Will say you are lying. Will say your client is a liar. Uh, when you do a corporate agreement, your opponent who is drafting the corporate agreement will draft to support their client. And you'll be like, what the hell, man? How can you do this? You know, why are you bullying my client? And in corporate agreements, you will see clients uh, or opponents who have the higher upper hand, who have the bigger bargaining power. They bully you, you know? So in my early days in my career, I remembered uh, being overtly passionate I sometimes, uh, unfortunately, say the wrong thing at the wrong time. Send an email when I'm angry. Uh, Daniel, very, very bad. Yeah. Uh, and I'm unfortunately paying the price for it. You know, so until now, sometimes when I meet my opponent, they still remember me as the guy who called call them or met them in court and scolded them in court. You know? uh, but of course, you know, in my defense, most of the time, uh, I, was, I turned out to be correct because they were being nasty and difficult and evil. Um, but you know, as you grow older, you learn how to handle this. And, uh, so interpersonal so, skills. Lah. Yeah. So unfortunately for me, it was uh, a, a, a character flaw in me that I sometimes get overly passionate. Uh, some people say lo losing temper, you know. So it's important that you must stay calm. So I, do, that's I, do, I just don't want to say, uh, Daniel, something simple like, stay calm, then move on. You know, what the hell does that stay calm mean? Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. So uh, I would encourage all of you, never send an email when you're angry. Never call when you're upset. You know, if you are pissed off, walk out of the court, count 10 times, come back in. 
You know, if your opponent says something nasty in court, he's just doing his job. She's just doing their job. You also saying nasty something to that fella. You know, so these are things we need to stay. So stay calm, stay calm. Then another important character is communication. Simple things like sending WhatsApp messages to your team. Choose the correct words. Learn to use the correct phrase. Pick up the thesaurus. Understand what word to use at what time. You know, if you're going to write in Bahasa Malaysia, don't just cut and paste from another lawyer because you are poor in Bahasa Malaysia. If I were you, all these law students now, from now onwards, you should pick up a Bahasa Malaysia newspaper and read. Or find a decent Bahasa Malaysia magazine to read. There are some pretty good blogs out there who write in proper Bahasa Malaysia. And read it. You know? So these are examples. You should do your communication skills, your verbal and your written skills. It is important, uh, crucial, in fact, that you must have an effective communication skills. How do you speak to your colleague? How do you speak to your client? When you meet your client, how do you start the meeting? Right? When to shut up? When to talk? Of course, all this also comes with experience, Daniel. You can't really acquire all these skills at the end of your CLP or bar exams. Uh, you take a lifetime. I'm still learning. In fact, until now, I sometimes still, you know, let allow my passion to get the better of me, especially when in a heated moment trying to win a case. Uh, I, I, you know, even at, age, at the age of 47 and I'm still uh, managing my passion. What more when you are only 20 years old? Uh, so it's understandable. So these are some skills I would recommend. The other one is management of files, management of work. So see like now, for example, I'm not trying to show off. I have a note in front of me. So I, I prepared a notebook and I'm writing down what Daniel is asking me. So if you join my law firm, for example, the first thing I give a, an intern is a notebook. So I, I'll actually give a person like this. And in my law firm, we, we have lots and lots and lots of copies of this notebook. And you'd be surprised, Daniel, one of the books I use is the, our school's uh, Buku Latihan. Oh. <laughs> you know, the brown color book, yeah. One of the brown book, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I give it to them. And I say that every time any of the partner call you, any of the senior lawyer call you, as in your, your senior call you to come to the table, bring that book along with a pen. Just bring along. Whatever he or she is saying, write down. Oh, you can't remember everything. This is taking notes, being responsible. Then when you finish, you go back, you read again. You read again what was written. Then you understand the instructions and proceed. So uh, the other skills that I highly recommend for us to take is, uh, especially now in the modern times, Daniel, is the understanding of how technology works. Okay. Uh, how Google Drive works. Dropbox work, different firms have different technological um, standards. Some firms are highly technological. Some firms are barely technological. It's your luck in which firm you join. <laughs> so like my firm, for example, we are all on Google. We use Google Suites, Google Drive. Uh, our Long before Zoom, we've always been using, using Google Meet. Okay. I have had video conference for years before this. So we need to understand that. We need to understand how to use uh, hard drive, uh, sharing on WhatsApp, uh, sharing on Telegram. Um, all this internet thing, you need to know. Hardware and software. Very important to earn, learn the skills. Okay. All your okay. skills. Uh, no, I, I'm just going to get you to speak some more a little bit. Uh, hmm. Networking skills. How important is that? Some, some, uh, a lot of students come and ask me, look, I, I'm not the sociable type. I don't like to go out, meet people, things like that. I just want to focus on the law. You know, law is my passion. Is it realistic to be like that? Can you survive? Can you thrive as a lawyer if you are someone that just wants to bury his books in the laws, in the submissions, and going to court. Well, what's your view on that? Mm. Um, I think 
it's not just uh, perhaps networking is a fairly um, how should I say commercial phrase, hmm. right? So actually, it's more of interaction, Yeah, the key is interaction. So uh, yeah. And you're right. You know, some some pupils they are fairly effective in speaking. Some are naturally smooth when they talk. Um, some uh, when they talk to you, their eyes are looking everywhere. Um, some just can't talk. Some don't know how to say. So to me, if 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 you want to interact with people, if you are unable to communicate well and you know that naturally your verbal communication skills may be, may be found wanting, then I would recommend you to write. Use your social media. In a professional world, use LinkedIn. Write articles. <laughs> make sure the articles are grammatically correct. <laughs> and make sure you're not writing nonsense on an article. Um, especially, like, for example, like today, the most... Uh, uh, um, how should I say, most pressing change of the law the last four days is the coming into force of Section 17A of the MACC Act 2009. So like for me, I've been preparing it for years and eventually it just came out now. So many people are now writing articles about 17A. Some very shallow, some pretty good. Some just write for the sake of writing. But that's one way to communicate, you know, to, to interact and to build, in your words, network. But uh, nothing beats face-to-face -face meeting. Um, nothing beats the opportunity to have a um, dialogue and a conversation, interaction, exchange of ideas, exchange phone numbers, exchange emails. Uh, nothing beats that, actually. And I, I would recommend that uh, most of you try and do that. Um, if you're unable, if you're not confident to speak to a senior lawyer, speak to your peers first in the event. You know? But with the advent of uh, social media, we can always uh, network through social media. Yeah. Mm. I, I know of many people on my Facebook who's my Facebook friend, and I've never met them in my life. <laughs> Yeah, but they added me and I look at them. I say, okay, you know, uh, law student, sure, why not? So, uh, but I, I also don't add some people. I just, you know, it, it's my Facebook. It's up to me who I want to add. But yeah, it, that's, that's the other way. Okay, I think that has been uh, incredibly useful for our participants. We're going to get into questions now. So once again, for all of you here in the Zoom meet, uh, please type in your questions in the group chat. Now, if you are watching us on Facebook, I am uh, not really looking at that right now, but type in your questions, leave an email address. I'm sure we can get Richard to answer you, or I can give you Richard's uh, email address and you will be able to ask him directly. So now on Zoom, right? So if there are any questions, type it in the group chat. Uh, Richard, a question from Van Helsing. I don't know if that's his real name. <laughs> on the issue of work-life balance, as you mentioned, is that a possibility for lawyers in reality? Mm. Can lawyers have a work-life balance, Richard? You see, the problem with that phrase, Daniel, is the definition of work-life balance. That's the problem. So um, when the person who asked the question, what is your interpretation and your perception of work-life balance? If the def in, 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 the, in that person's perception, Work-life balance is working 8.30 to 5 and going home, not answering the emails on Saturday, Sunday, not bothered about anything about office after 5.30, then that is an impossible definition. Not just for legal practice, for any kind of work. Now, unfortunately, in the modern times, over the last 20 years, these have controlled our lives. You know? So whether we like it or not, people can get in touch with us through text message, WhatsApp, Telegram, WeChat, that direct messaging from Instagram, Twitter, you're, you know, you're on Instagram live, people can see you, etc., etc. So it's impossible to not to ignore this. So once you accept that you cannot ignore the intervention of the communication machines like this, 
then it is virtually impossible to have a nine to five work-life balance. So that's the first problem. What's your definition? I tell you my definition of work-life balance. My definition of work-life balance is that every night I, 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 I'm married, I have a daughter. So every night I insist I must have dinner with my family. Always want to get married. You know, have dinner with your family. Chat with my daughter. Most of the time, she's now 19. So communication is a little bit um, distance. Um, but I try, you know, try to understand what's happening. She chat about her TikTok, find out about her new boyfriend, you know. So that's my work life balance. On the weekends, I insist spending time with my wife, you know, simple, simple things like going out, holding hands, watching a movie, buying grocery together. But that's my definition of work life balance. My, my, my daily life, I can tell you, like Daniel, just preparing for today. You know, I was awake by 8 o'clock this morning. I had no court, so I can wake up late. 8 o'clock is late. 8 o'clock, I was awake. Uh, it was raining. <laughs> I was tempted to sleep. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I had to wake up, start answering the emails on a mobile phone, uh, sorted things out in the house, and then made a decision that today I'll work from home. Then before I responded to this uh, webinar, continue answering emails and text messages from client. In fact, there's one text message now waiting for me to reply. Um, and then by 12.30, 1 o'clock, I slowed down, had a quick phone call to my law firm, get things ready, and I told my lawyers, don't disturb me between 1.30 to 4 o'clock uh, because I want to do this. And then after 4, I'll do a video conference. I have a second video conference at 6, have dinner with my family, then I'm back on the, on the laptop by 9 o'clock to answer the next emails. And of course, when I'm answering emails, I'm actually doing legal work. Uh, and then, of course, any contracts that we have to go through, my lawyers will send to me, affidavits, they'll send to me for approval, uh, second opinion, blah, blah, blah. And by the time, it'll be about almost midnight. And that's where I finally rest to watch TV. And I usually sleep by 2 or 3 o'clock every day. Even if I'm caught, that's, I, I, I can't sleep. I'm by nature, my mind, I, I, have, I have a bed in so many, I, I can't sleep. It's been like that since uh, I was in Form 5. So um, uh, by 2 o'clock, I'm asleep. The next day, the whole thing repeats. You know, so, and then on Saturday, Sundays, uh, you know, wake up in the morning on Saturday, I'll reply all the emails that I can. Then I put aside my handphone and spend time with the family. Uh, at night, go through the email again. The same thing I re repeat on Sunday. Uh, and then Monday, back to work. So, uh, Hardly any time for TV, uh, unless Everton is playing, then, then I'll watch. Uh, you know, um, most of the time, I'm, I'm, I'm scrolling on my phone because that's the only way to find out the news. Uh, people always say that, Richard, I'm on the phone, but they don't realize I'm putting notes, I'm typing notes, I'm reading Malaysia Kini, um, whatever I can read, blah, 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 you know. So that's my work-life balance. And most of my lawyers have a similar life. You know, uh, but of course, I think most of them watch Netflix and play TikTok more than me. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so and also like you know, my law firm we have uh, we have so many social media, so I have to manage the social media uh, because I'm also running the business development of the firm. So we have YouTube. Uh, I'm running with my colleague uh, YouTube. We have Instagram, which we update every day. Uh, the timing of the Instagram is important when we update. Uh, Facebook, every day. Twitter, every day. LinkedIn, every day. And many people don't know, we have Twitch. My law firm is one of the few law firms we have Twitch. We went live a few times uh, streaming on Twitch because it's an esports uh, platform. But we, I have not really gone deep into it. But soon, uh, we will have a RWC Twitch TV where we'll be talking about esports law over there soon, uh, hopefully in time. So these are things, my daily life, la, are then a bit hard la, to say work-life balance. So that, to me, I think I have a work-life balance. That, that's important. And I, like, like I've said before, we can, we can only uh, get your perspective on this and, and we, are, we are grateful for it. The next question, Richard, I'm going to answer. Uh, is there a legal dictionary in BM? Yes, there is. 
please go to bookstore buy you can get a bm english english bm one as well okay the next one we've got a, a few very interesting questions i hope uh, you have time for us richard yeah all like, let's answer it all yeah no problem in light of the pandemic how is the employability of young graduates and young lawyers in law firms today is it massively affected what do you think well uh the last three months uh uh i held a few webinars i think you may know uh, rwc had i think we have 24 webinars tomorrow we are having our 25th webinar um and one of the webinars we had was uh, two in fact two of it we had was the impact of uh, covid-19 on legal firms uh one was related to clang valley and one was related to the entire uh peninsula of malaysia and all the speakers there considered that uh, it is likely to affect the employer uh, employment opportunities for new lawyers i think all law firms now are tightening their budgets tightening their purse all law firms are going through cash flow challenges uh, all law firms are now facing uh, financial uncertainties you know so uh, even though the what there may be some law firms doing fairly well but they could have done better if not for the covid-19 so uh, to answer every that question i have to unfortunately be the messenger of bad news that i think it will be a challenge for most uh, people to join law firms as pupils or for legal associates but having said that i think most law firms wouldn't mind subject to budget engaging uh, temporary interns bringing in someone to work for a month or two to help out the firm uh, you know in terms of budget the firm will probably just pay the intern anything between 500 to 1005 2000 depending on the size of the firm um, so for some lawyers they don't mind because they need a temporary help but they cannot afford to commit to 9 months of pupilage or accepting a person as a new lawyer unlikely but having said that maybe you can go through websites like uh, elawyer.com uh, i think adi is still uh, trying to get lawyers there some law firms to be fair some are looking for new lawyers they are and then if you look at the other uh, recruitment uh, companies uh, they are uh, I, i still receive emails they are still looking for new lawyers so there is a possibility of of, of job i am not giving a blanket no job answer i'm just saying that things will be a challenge so that's and my I, answer i think uh, it's fairly obvious that uh, all industries are having a tough time right but uh, it is not the end of the world hang on just like richard said do internships get some experience make your cv look good sometimes do things like uh, volunteer work that helps your cv also uh, look good you know it shows character Uh, we've got a question from Gerard Gerard Tang I think uh, we both know Gerard uh good afternoon Richard and Daniel do you think that a master's degree not necessarily law related might uh, increase your chances of securing a pupilage job uh, in pupilage or a job in the legal field in Malaysia uh maybe not necessarily now but I think in general he's asking a well uh, I think most law firms in Klang Valley uh Uh, and the major cities and i'm not diminishing law firms uh, outside clang valley and the major cities yeah i mean if you have a law firm in kampa or kulim or tamerlo i'm not diminishing those kind of law firms but i think um, law firms who deal with uh, perhaps financial fi- finances financial services uh, corporate work uh, they probably will appreciate a person with a masters degree uh, not withstanding the kind of degree the the kind of master's degree the person is holding uh but for me personally i i think it is a uh, an a, a good addition a positive addition um may persuade us to engage you but just like my earlier comments i don't think is definitive okay i i i don't i'm not my my opinion is not universal i know some law firms they highly value a master's degree holder Okay, thank you, Richard. Uh, we got a question from Ajit here. Um, what are the prospects for employment for for 
and I'm assuming he's going to, he's asking employment in legal firms, law firms, huh? for people with disabilities. So uh, um, I know Ajit, so I, I think I'm going to include disabilities that are visible and maybe disabilities that are not so visible as well, right? And then he also has a follow-up question, right? Uh, should we disclose that? Would it decrease the chances of employability? What do you well, think, Ajit? Um... When I was a secretary of the bar, we had this problem, uh, a challenge where certain pupils, uh, after joining the firm, the master discovered that the pupil have, um, um, what's that word? Aesthetic, uh, no, um, there's, there's a word for it, a person. Um, so it was quite difficult for the law firm to deal with the pupil. And uh, the Legal Profession Act doesn't deal with a person with, for example, uh, mental uh, health issues. So that is one disability uh, which has not been addressed by the LPA. That, that's very difficult to deal with. But for physical uh, and even unseen disabilities, I don't see a problem. Uh, I think if you inform the law firm that you have this challenge, this disability, uh, yeah, some law firms may say, I'm sorry, I, I can't take you because we are operating in a shop lot. You have to climb up and down the staircase. Can you do it? If you have that kind of physical disability, you know? So, so it depends on the geographic and the logistics, geographic location and the logistics of the law firm and the kind of character of the partner you're dealing with. You know, so uh, for me personally, I have no problems if, if, if you are disabled, but your, I'm, a, I'm engaging your attitude, I'm engaging your brains, I'm a, engaging your character. If you are hardworking, you're honest, your integrity, but you're on a wheelchair, so what? You know, so in fact, I think it's the other way around. I think if you're on a wheelchair and you're in front of me, well done. Well, you must have done really well despite such a challenge and you did it. So, yeah, but and, and yes, you must disclose. Please, never ever not disclose to your your partner. I mean, your master. Richard, the next question, I think you are very well suited to answer. But it's again, uh, I suppose if you if you can, if you could just give us a few short pointers. The question is very general. What would be your advice if I want to open my own law firm from Abigail? So, like I said, it's a huge area, I'm sure. But uh, maybe your top tips. Well, um, I think very important is uh, when you want to set up your law firm is you need to ensure that you have a fairly comfortable sense of experience. Um, I find it sometimes quite amazing that some lawyers, right after pupilage, immediately establish their own law firm. Very brave. Um, some succeed. Some struggle badly. And rightly so because they lack experience. But having said that, um, you never underestimate the resilience of a human being. Never underestimate the heart of a person. Sometimes in the most trying and difficult moment, that, pers that person will prevail. So I will never say no to uh, any person who wants to set up a firm at any time of their career. But my advice is that please ensure that you have a fairly comfortable knowledge. Of course, it's very subjective. To you is comfortable, to me, maybe you're not good enough. I don't know. Uh, but if you're able to handle yourself well and you're able to hold yourself well, then that's one good start. But secondly is that, uh, and this is something uh, very, very commercially important, is that you must have the ability to attract clients. If clients don't trust you, don't know you, don't like you, won't go to you, then you can't have a law firm. So uh, it is important that your firm is able to attract clients. So um, I, I always tell uh, the future young lawyers who want to, I mean, the young lawyers who want to open law firm, if you can't get sufficient clients and you know you don't have that many clients, then don't open your own firm yet. You know, so it's not easy. But uh, that is the second and to me, very important factor, whether you are able to attract clients, then you will know better. You will know. When you have people who want to give you work, 
want to engage you, want to appoint you, and then you know you're there. All yours there. Oh, I think Daniel's internet <laughs> is hanging. Uh, Richard, I'm back. I'm back. Okay, I'm back. Right. I think uh, there was a problem earlier, but I'm back. Okay, uh, I'm just going to, guys, thank you for all the questions. I may have to start picking and choosing, but this one was very interesting to me uh, from uh, Chu Cheng Lin. Good day, Richard. Uh, while you were studying and pursuing your career, do you, did you ever feel like giving up? Did you feel like it was a, you were powerless? If so, how did you overcome these negative thoughts? Uh, what was your mindset leading you to your success? Uh, that's a really, really good. Uh, I, I know I keep on saying, but generally, the questions are all very good. Yeah, good it's not all. Yeah, it's all those uh, silly questions. Uh, sometimes I get it, uh, but yeah, really good question. Uh, thanks, uh, Chu Cheng Lin. Uh, um, the truth is that in any job that we do, uh, you ask Mister. All of you should ask Mister. Daniel, how difficult <laughs> is it to run a law school, especially in the shadows of. Uh, People like Danny Chu, you know, yeah. and you go to Brickfields, you work there, you are in the shadows of Raja Singham, our ex ATC speak lecturer, Mr. Murali Kandasamy. These are giants of college administrators. They run the college really, really well. How difficult it is. And sometimes, you know, we just want to take a break and give up. Of course, uh, I'm no different. You know, there are times where, um, the work seems overbearing. The client seems to be unfair and unreasonable. Your opponent is, uh, your opposing counsel is nasty. And then you, you have to handle um, quite a number of things here and there. And then every day you have to make a decision based on data and information which is weak. But we have to make a decision to go somewhere. It can be daunting. But, you know, like, like what John F. Kennedy once said in the context of uh, why they want to go to the moon, he gave a speech as, at NASA and he said this, he said that, that in, in the context of trying to go, to go to the moon, he said that we do what we do, not because it's easy, but because it's difficult. And only when it's difficult, you know how strong you are, how good you are. And unfortunately, I must tell all the law students, that the legal profession is a difficult one because you're dealing with people's lives, people's career, people's uh, legal problems. It is labor intensive. You're always typing, 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 research, 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 thinking, 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 writing, 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 writing every day. That is your life. That is your work. And you get paid for it. Just like a doctor, surgery, 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 or the ENT doctor looking into your throat every day the dentist will look into your mouth every day. That is the life of a professional. So uh, it is something we are trained to do. And um, so yes, there are times, uh, Cheng Lin, I do feel like giving up. But let me tell you why I never did. Because um, I think of the clients who rely on me. I think of uh, my colleagues who rely on me. My colleagues who... Of course, now I'm a partner of a firm. I own my firm. People come and work with me. I pay them salary. They have to pay for the house. They got children. Um, I can't let them down. And also, I like law. I really like being a lawyer. And one of the areas, and I'll talk in more detail in the next talk, one of the areas I like is sports law, which you know I stumbled upon it by chance about seven, eight years ago. And um, in fact, I can tell you, Daniel, that my interest in sports law, to a large extent, saved my legal career. Hmm. Because for, for a long time, I was disillusioned, uh, tired of the politics in a bar, tired of dealing with people uh, who, the moment they don't agree with you, start attacking you hmm. and gossiping about you in the worst possible way, just because you don't agree with the person. Tired. But I, was, uh, I stumbled upon sports, you know, by chance, even though I've always liked sports, even in LLB. I used to ask Danny Chung those days, uh, do you have law or sports? Those days in 1995, law related to sports, he said, don't have those days. So um, 
but I like law and I enjoy doing law and my, I'm, I'm passionate about it. For, for example, now sports law, I, I love doing it. And that passion has kept me alive lah, and going. So it's a combination of uh, people relying on me, respect for people who invested their time in me, people who believe in me, clients who believe in me, believe in my clients, uh, I mean, believe in my firm, clients who support us. I just want to make sure that I don't let them down. But at the same time, you internally, you must have that passion. You can't just work for people. You must also work for yourself. So you must like what you do. And for me, luckily, I am, uh, most of the time, I like what I'm doing. Most of the time. But sometimes it's, it's quite tiring. And, but these are the, for example, what I'm doing now, this very second, Daniel, I love it. Because I know to many people, I used to be a law lecturer a long, long time ago before I became a lawyer. And maybe one day when I retire, I would like to become a law lecturer again so that I can share my knowledge with the young people. I like teaching. So this is something I like. So I, yeah, so I do these kind of things actually, Daniel, agreeing to webinars and talks actually is to keep me going. That's good. Uh, I think uh, you've answered that question uh, really, really well, right? Thank you for, for that. Cheers. Uh, Farah, Farah, FIFA, what do firms expect from interns? Uh, this one, Farah, I'm just going to ask you to just uh, take a look at the video again later on Facebook, because I think all the characteristics of a lawyer and all will also be with interns. But uh, do you have anything specifically for interns to add, uh, Richard? I think when, you are, and, and when you're working as an intern, is different compared to a pupil. Okay. Um, uh, in a, as an intern, you only got one month, maybe two months to work with a law firm. And I think it's very important at the time you, you really stay alert, observe what's happening. Look at the words the lawyers use. We speak differently. For example, we don't use the word sample. We use the word precedent. We don't use the word things like, uh, um, uh, what do you call this? Uh, make sure you go to court tomorrow. But instead, what we do is that, is it in your diary? Enter diary. These are phrases which we lawyers use all the time. So observing it is very important. Observing your boss is very important. Uh, stay humble. Of course, they want two months as an intern. And pick up and absorb as much as you can at two months. Be hardworking. Best times. Interns are the best times. No, no accountability. High <laughs> excitability. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. And, and I think internships uh, help, right? Internships really help. It shows, it gives you a, a bit of experience. It gives you a bit of insight into the practice area as well, isn't it? Totally. I wish I had, I, I had internship in my time. In the 90s, there was no such thing as internship. Okay, uh, Ajit is back again. And he's asking uh, if you have uh, unorthodox skills, like uh, the ability to speak Urdu or Farsi, uh, would that be an advantage? Or should we still focus on our orthodox skills? That is a very good skill to have. Uh, for example, my firm, we have a fairly large uh, Chinese-speaking, Mandarin-speaking community. And I'm a banana Chinese, so I can only speak English and Malay. Uh, unless you're Hokkien. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a Hokkien Chinese. But I can't speak Mandarin and Cantonese to save my life. I think the only time when I speak Cantonese, you'll probably slap my face. Yeah, <laughs> it's that kind of words. Uh, but... I think if your, uh, your, if your law firm is involved with Urdu-speaking clients uh, or you may have some, some projects involving that language, ah, good, good to have it. Go ahead, do it. And uh, the last question today, and uh, it's been a list of wonderful questions, like you said, Richard. The last question, I think, is a bit of a philosophical question. If you were not a practitioner, what would you have be? What would your career path have been? <laughs> From Van Helsing. Mm, Van Helsing again. Yeah. <laughs> Good question, Van Helsing. Let, let me share something. Um, uh, I love sports. That's quite obvious. And in school, I was a football player. I was a lousy football player, by the way. No good. But I was a school captain because... Um, I had skills of management. I could manage the team. Can you imagine those days, uh, Daniel? I was Form 5. I was a manager of my team and I was coaching my Form 5 team. Mm. Uh, and we won the Under-18 tournament that year. Uh, I actually went to library to read up 
on uh, whatever left tiny books about coaching and the St. Michael's Library was fantastic. I can't believe that they have that kind of book. Uh, and I always knew that I, I, I would have loved to become a professional football player, even at that time, uh, much to my father's dismay, who wanted <laughs> me to be a lawyer. Um, but, you know, I wasn't a good player. And there was very little opportunity at the time to become a football manager or football coach. So, but if I'm at, at your age now, if I'm, I'm, I'm 20 years old now, I'm 19 now, I would love to really become a professional football player. You know, uh, it, it's, I, I love the game. It's uh, the, the passion of the game, uh, the teamwork, uh, comradeship, strategy, the, how to score the goal, creating space for yourself, blah, blah, blah. I love it. And alternatively, I would have loved to become a football manager. I, I would have, uh, if I was in, in Europe, I was born in Europe, I am pretty sure that I would be a football manager now. <laughs> yeah, pretty sure. Yeah, then uh, at least in a third or fourth division club, you know, even an amateur club, I would love it just to be a manager, to run a team. And in fact, in, in, uh, when I was a lecturer uh, in the law school, I was the manager of the, lecturer, uh, of the law school's football team. We went all the way to the semifinals and lost uh, in the inter-college games. So, um, uh, these, these are things I would love to do. So, to answer Van Helsing's question, uh, ideally, I would have preferred to be a football player or a football manager. Uh, but being a lawyer isn't a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, uh, if you know Richard well, you will know his passion for football is obvious for everyone to see. His passion for his uh, club is obvious for everyone to see, <laughs> right? Um, okay, we don't have any more questions. So we've come. Uh, this has been an awesome session. It's been a, an hour and 40 minutes. And uh, at our peak, we had about uh, 75 people on, uh, on, on Zoom and then much more on, uh, on Facebook. Now, for the rest of you who are still here, Richard is going to be speaking with us uh, on uh, sports law. That's coming up next week, if I'm not mistaken. Please go to the ATC Facebook page, Instagram, Richard Wee Chambers, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and all of that to get the promotional details, right? Uh, Richard, there's a whole bunch of thank you messages coming in, all directed towards you. Uh, I, I won't read it, but uh, I, they, they loved you, obviously, right? So I'm sure you can see it. Right? <laughs> so you, those of you, you who are wanting to say thank you, you can put it in the chat group now. Uh, thank you for attending. Please follow us on Facebook. Please follow us on uh, Instagram for more such talks. Uh, we are going to be getting a whole bunch of alumni who are, who are, who are uh, leaders of their field. Uh, and, and Richard is going to play a large role in that. I believe next week he's got one more and another one of his partners is the week after that on yeah. uh, hospitality and tourism law. That, that's uh, that's uh, interesting, right? Yeah. Okay, guys. I, I'm yeah. just checking our... Our next session is on 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 uh, June the June the eleven, right? Yeah, the the promo material hasn't come out yet, but it should be out really soon. Richard, thank you very much, everybody. Oh, also, okay. Then just want to say thank you to everybody here. Thank, number one, thank you to ADC. It's been always a good good college to me. Uh, I hope you and Kevin will continue leading, uh, and all your team of leaders continue leading the college well. Um, uh, you know try to be the best that you can, uh, is you. number thank one. You. For the law students here, uh, thank you for uh, and some of your pupils. I see some of your uh, pupils from law firms. Thank you very much for logging in and listening to, to my views. I hope whatever I said could have helped you. Um, there, are, there are things that, you, unfortunately, you just need to go through yourself. But if you need help, uh, look for me and uh, my website. Uh, uh, you, you can click follow on my RWC Facebook or you can subscribe to our YouTube. You can go there. You can follow our progress. But if you want to contact me directly, uh, just send me an email at rw at richardvchambers.com, rw at richardvchambers.com. Um, or you just go to my law firm and just send the general email there. Uh, I would, my team members will pick it up and send to me. Thank you so much for your time. Good luck to you and study hard. So I just want to repeat that. Uh, Richard Wee Chambers, check it out. Uh, YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, uh, similarly ATC, right? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.